40, 50 years ago would have been thought of as B-movies. Right. They are programmers. They are the kinds of things that used to be the staples of Saturday afternoon serials or, or kiddie movies. And um, they go back a little bit further from the 70s, and you have movies like Lawrence of Arabia or Bridge in the River Kwai. And um, you, had, you had movies of substance that were for grown-ups. And sadly, the, um, the movie business out here has kind of abandoned that audience uh, in, in favor of this kind of quick-fix global reach that they can get with, um, you know, people running around in tights. Yeah, rather than producing another Lawrence of Arabia, they're, they're churning out Dr. Goldfoot and the Girl Bombs. <laughs> it's, you very, know? it's very true. <laughs> that's, um, that's become the A picture. <laughs> it has, and, and it's just simply a reflection of budget now, and A picture's um, defined by how much it costs, not what the content is. Um, and the, the care and the precision, I mean, the, the craftsmanship in movies has never been better, and the special effects, obviously, are at a whole new level. But the, the level of storytelling, the stories that we're choosing to tell, are very primitive, almost back to a, a kind of silent era uh, movie that will play across the world. Because, you know, obviously now almost 60 to 70 percent of the, the global box office take is outside of North America. So that's, that's been another reality that's changed the way the business works. Well, it was only a few years ago <clears throat> that you wrote the Fantastic Four movie. And uh, you did the sequel as well. I did, I yeah. believe, yeah. And actually, you put an interesting twist on that movie that I saw reflected in the Iron Man film, which was having the superheroes um, sort of digging the fact that they are superheroes. <laughs> yeah, that was... that. Well, that was... Fantastic Four was always the most lighthearted of the Marvel comics. It was really a, a kind of funny, dysfunctional family that, um, especially in its early uh uh, iterations, um, there was not the deep brooding psychological aspect that you you got in Spider Man or in the Hulk even. Um, so we wanted to, those movies to be fun um, and and essentially comic in tone. I have to I have to admit that I think that the Silver Surfer story got bungled in the second one. But you know, the, you're building a battleship in these things, and you have no idea what they're going to do with the blueprints when right. you. Uh, once you've handed them over. So um, if anybody hated that movie, I, I, I know where you're coming from. <laughs> well, it's funny. I can't really remember the sequel. I did see it, but uh, I do remember the first one. And, you know, my thought on that is, well, Jessica Alba, Michael Chiklis, what's not to love? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Chiklis in a big orange uh, rubber <laughs> suit was, you know, uh, pretty good. And, and Chris Evans, I think, you know, has proven that he's going to be a movie star. Oh, yeah. He played the Human Torch, so... I, I, he does a really fine job in Captain America. So, um, yeah, the, Marvel's done a very smart thing. That that was still at a point where Marvel did not control properties. So right. they were having to deal with different studios. And now they've had this kind of meta strategy that began with the first Iron Man movie, where you were there, the the concept of the Avengers, which yes. is, which will be out next year, and it's proven to be a very very sound uh, strategy. So we'll see where that ends up. You know, another TV series that uh, you, uh, I guess, created with David Lynch, and it was right off the back of Twin Peaks, and I don't think the networks aired, I think they maybe aired a few of the episodes, but it all came out on video at the time, was on the air, mm. which I loved. I, I That was sort of like a, a twisted love letter to, we mentioned your show of shows, like you know, to a, a variety show. Yeah, 1950s yeah. live television. Well, that that was born out of David had loved that period, and my father had worked in that um, that era. He was the stage manager on Philco Playhouse, which was one of the the two big weekly drama shows. And I'd always heard hilarious stories from him about the the terrors of putting on a live drama every week, um, and and the mishaps that were almost unbelievable. Um, so that was the kind of inspiration for that. I. Again, the the show suffered a little bit because we were still making Twin Peaks, and it's it's hard enough making one show a week. Right. It's almost <laughs> impossible to do two, and I think we ended up making six or seven episodes of On the Air. Well, it was a very funny show, um, especially the the very first episode. 
Yeah, the pilot I thought was the most successful. We we had a lot of fun making that one. And there were some good guest stars like Chuck McCann. Yeah, Chuck. Yeah. You know, Chuck McCann. Had, uh, funny story. Had uh, was my neighbor for many years. Oh, really? And I got to know him just walking the dog over over time. And um, I, I I put Chuck in a movie that I directed in 1992 called Storyville. Mm-hmm. So I I had seen his performance, a wonderful performance in a movie called The Heart Is a Lonely Hunter in the late 60s. Right. And, and uh, he had been, if you don't remember him, if your audience doesn't remember him, he had started as a kid show host in New York and was famous later as a guy who did all sorts of um, commercials and funny voices for cartoons. He was the cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs guy. Right. Uh, he had a kind of an amazing career, and I thought he was underutilized as an actor. And so I, I worked with him a couple of times, and you know he couldn't have been a nicer guy. I would recommend to anyone actually uh, listening who is interested in anything that Chuck McCann did. He did a movie in 1970 or 71 called The Projectionist. Yes, it's a brilliant oh, movie. Oh, what an incredible film. Yeah. But I do want to ask you this. Uh, you know, as as an author as well, and, and you, you have an interest in historical fiction. Right. Uh, what led you into, into that realm? Well, uh, um, I had started out writing fiction as a kid, and, and that had always been my, uh, that was my entry into writing, and it was something I'd, I'd kind of set aside as I got into writing for first the theater and then for film and television, and I wanted to go back and, and write a novel. I just had that, um, that hunger to do that, and I had come up with this notion, this was, I guess, 1992, 93, when the book came out. The List of Seven was the book. Yes. And... Um, I had this notion that maybe uh, wouldn't it be fun if Arthur Conan Doyle had known a man um, in his own life who had become the inspiration for Holmes, but who was actually quite a bit different from the way Holmes was depicted. Um, and so uh, that was the book, and I wrote a sequel to it called The Six Messiahs that came out a couple of years later. Uh, and I sort of stayed with that with, uh, with another book that I wrote, about four years ago, called The Second Objective, a World War II book. Yes. That dealt with a, a real episode in World War II that was quite terrifying um, and and brought real characters in contact with some fictional ones. And um, that was a lot, that's a lot of fun. It's, I, I do love history and I love interweaving stories out of real events, um, which is partly what led me to writing some nonfiction as well. So to do that in those books was a way for me to kind of unite those passions. Did you ever think of adapting The List of Seven and The Six Messiahs for for film? Because it almost seems tailor-made. Well, we, we've come close many times. I mean, yes, the, the book was optioned by a studio, and um, uh, I did write the screenplay, and we had a very big director attached uh, more than once and came close about three times, and each time for whatever reason and this often happens in the film business, you just can't quite make it over the goal line. and um, So that's been the fate of List of Seven, regrettably. Well, you know, there's always hope. There is always <laughs> There's hope. always hope. It still could happen. Um, you know, getting back to, to Twin Peaks for a second, I, I was watching the, uh, the finale of the second season, and I'm, I'm of two minds about this because... You'll see, especially now with uh, younger people discovering it for the first time, there's this need to know what happens next, what happens next. And in a way, I kind of think that the show being cut short like it was and ending on this on this cliffhanger, in a way, keeps it going. I, I, I tend to agree with you. You know, it, it ended um, at an ending point. It, <laughs> it, it didn't necessarily wrap everything up, but... Um, it did bring you to a conclusion. You know, it was that was brought up to me a lot when The Sopranos ended its run a few years ago, and the the way that um, David Chase ended that last episode became very controversial. Um, and I thought that it was one of the more brilliant endings that I'd ever seen in anything. Um, uh, people wanted to know, well, did Tony get killed? Did right. did he survive? And and I felt that. He answered all those questions. He just didn't answer them with the def- the definitiveness that people were hoping they were going to get. If you look at it very carefully, I think you can figure it out for yourself um, what was about to happen. And um, 
so Twin Peaks has that kind of resonance. It uh, it it doesn't completely end, but it 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 finishes. Um, or maybe it's the other way around. <laughs> um, and I I think that's uh, you know that's something to think about. Well, I know that there were plans for another season. Obviously, um, there was talk of uh, you know a third season at, at one point. Yeah, we came very close to doing a third season, and and it was only at the last minute that. ABC got cold feet and and decided not to pursue it. But um, we had a lot of ideas laid out for where where it might have gone, and I think we would have come back and and probably had a really strong season had we been given the opportunity. Well, you know, there's a there's a strange thing about the second season that's always been a mystery to me. And if I've got you on the phone, this is the the perfect opportunity. <laughs> there's it, the series to me seem to be going in the direction of a Cooper Audrey romance and then and then it it didn't really happen well there was there, that was in fact where we were going and uh w- when we got there we had a little bit of a problem with um with our cast 